Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. Today's episode is a really special one as well. It is the final episode of a series of interviews dedicated to celebrate Dr. Mark Caron, a giant and visionary in the GPCR field and beyond. In this episode, I sit down with my co-host, Dr. Kathleen Caron, the daughter of Mark Caron. Before we dive into this conversation, we are thrilled to announce that our ecosystem is expanding and are delighted to count domain therapeutics, GPCR Therapeutics, Design Pharmaceuticals, Montana Molecular, and Orion Biotechnology as our ecosystem partners in 2023. Become an ecosystem member yourself and join our partners and your colleagues today. The ecosystem is your GPCR-focused virtual playground. Join over 700 of your peers who are already started exploring, connecting, and collaborating better. You can explore the ecosystem by signing up and getting a free site membership. And when you're ready, you can also get a premium membership to unlock the ecosystem's full benefits. If you'd like to register your team or company, or if you live in a developing country, please reach out to us at hello at drgpcr.com and we'll be happy to help you join us. The list of benefits of the ecosystem is quite long. Today, we want to highlight that as a premium member, you can get in touch directly with your peers via chat, discuss GPCRs in the forum, and even ask topic-specific questions in a dedicated group, all in the ecosystem itself. Are you looking for your next career opportunity? Our job board in the ecosystem is a GPCR-focused one where you can explore different opportunities, and if you're looking to hire, you can submit your job description. Wondering what GPCR to attend next, GPCR meeting to attend next? Check out our event page where we have curated the next GPCR meetings for you. In case you're organizing a meeting, fill out the event submission page and then you can advertise your event directly in the ecosystem. Take advantage of everything that the new ecosystem and GPCR dedicated online playground has to offer today. Explore the possibilities by navigating the site using the direct links in the footer. Check it out today at drgpcr.com slash ecosystem. And now let's dive into my conversation with Dr. Kathleen Caron. Hello, everyone. This is Yamina, and I'm super excited today to have Kathleen Caron with me. Kathleen, welcome. Thank you, Yamina. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so excited to to talk to you, although we finished recording three consecutive episodes honoring your dad, Dr. Mark Caron, with a large panel where you served as my co-host. You kind of know where to go and where I'm going with the questions. Um, so why don't we start at the beginning? And if you would like to introduce yourself, please. Yeah, so I'm Kathleen Carone, and I'm professor and chair of the Cell Biology and Physiology Department, which is a large basic science department at UNC Chapel Hill, um, just a few miles down the road from Duke University, where my father uh, was a James B. Duke professor of cell biology for well over 40 years. I, I've lost track of the, the number <laughs> of years. Um, and so, um, yeah, it, it's been uh, fun to, you know, grow up scientifically in the same uh, sort of research triangle park area. And my research program uh, at first was not focused on uh, GPCRs and, and perhaps for good reasons. I, I you know, tried to do my early training in, in, in different disciplines. I'm pretty far away, but as, as any listener of this podcast knows, GPCRs rule all. Um, and so you, you cannot stray far away from GPCRs uh, for too long. And so my research program has come full circle and is now, you know, fully entrenched in the world of GPCRs. And, and that was a, a really great thing for me um, and, and a special relationship that I had with my father, um, you know, it, 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 given his uh, impact on the field and, and um, it, you know, he, he's, he's my father, he's my children's grandfather. Um, and that was always the priority. But every once in a while, he was also an advisor and a mentor and, uh, and you know, a great person to bounce off ideas and, uh, and share, you know, great, exciting stories about science. I love it. And I always ask people, how did you get to, into studying GPCRs? But I'd ask you, when did you first hear about GPCRs? Because I think you have, you may have a very interesting answer to that. I, I think I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a 
<laughs> so, so when did I first hear about GPCRs? Well, uh, when they were first cloned. Um, so, you know, I was, I was there. Uh, I, was, I was little, um, you know, four or five years old and um, remember those days very fondly, um, you know, in, in Bob Lefkowitz's lab. Um, you know, mostly I would sit in the administrative offices with, with the folks there um, and, and sort of watch into the lab while, the, you know, all the biochemistry was going on. Um, so I have memories, you know, as a child of, of playing with lab reagents and um, some of the frogs that they would bring in um, because they would isolate, you know, the material from these huge frogs. Um, and of course, I would get to play with them before they would euthanize them. Um, so so I, I truly grew up in, in a lab, always in a lab. And um, what my parents would always joke that, you know, at a very, very young age, you know, maybe three or four years old, I would you know, most, most little girls cook with their mothers in the kitchen, right? They have the kitchen sink and they yeah. have the pots and pans and the bubbles and they're cooking. And, and my parents would say, Kathleen, you know, what are you doing? And my reply at a very young age would be, I'm making cyclic AMP. <laughs> and so, you know, so my entire life, I've been sort of focused on <laughs> so, but, you know, I, I had to, to, you know, qualify that by saying that that's through the lens of a child, right? And yeah, of uh, course. and so so these these were the things I grew up with. Um, and I, I think you know most importantly for for young scientists who who consider a career in science, you know, to me, I I would hear those words and equate it with laughter and fun and excitement and passion. You know, I I didn't know what cyclic AMP was when I'm playing in the kitchen, helping my mom doing dishes. But but I knew that it was important and I knew my father loved it and I knew that he loved his job and his career. Um, and so, you know, that, that passion and love for science um, and just working hard and creating new things and discovering new things is something that, that both my parents instilled in, in the three of us and in, in the three kids. Um, so, you know, maybe it's not, not surprising that I ended up as a scientist. Um, and it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, ending up as a scientist. But first of all, let me take three steps back. I don't okay. think there were many people in the world who were there as observers as these GPCRs were being cloned. So you have a special place in the GPCR world from that perspective. And I think it's it's an amazing one because you saw it with 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 your child eyes, but then it got stored and it ended up propulsing you into being a scientist yeah the other the other thought I had is I I don't know how many scientists in the GPCR field there are that have their children also working in science not even less in in the GPCR field so I think this is you're in a very unique bubble Yes, it is. It's. I think there are a few. I've I've met a few people, and I I neglect if I cannot quite remember who they are. There there are a few, you know, father daughter teams or father son teams. Um, no, but but um, it is it is rather unique. And and my father and I had several occasions where we were both at conferences together. You know, now now as an adult, uh, you know, I'm giving giving lectures, and one of my favorite ones. It might have been a GPCR retreat, the Great Lakes GPCR retreat, or maybe it was a Keystone meeting. I, I can't quite remember, but um, I, I think that the organizers wanted to have a bit of fun. And they put my father and I both in the same session. So although I am classically trained as a reproductive biologist and cardiovascular physiologist, I was speaking with neuropsychopharmacologists, <laughs> and um, but you know I think it was kind of a running joke, and I I heard that there were bets um, in the audience of you know who would give the best talk, and so I think it was just fun for everyone to see the the father and then the daughter speak. And um, oh, and, he went first just to kind of add to your stress level there. I cannot remember who went first. Um, I but I do know I gave a better talk. <laughs> And I know that dad was so proud of it, you know, like that was the fun part, right? Um, that, that was so heartwarming, you know, throughout my career, he's just been my biggest champion. And, um, you know, he, he was happy and excited and, and wishful that, um, that I would give a better talk. And uh, I'm, I'm teasing, of course, you know, I, I can't oh, of course. talk of, as Mark Carone, but, you know, it, it was um, that love and support and just, you know, go get it, you know, and, and go do it. 
Um, I love so, it. Well, yeah. I recorded, now that we're talking on this podcast and people will hear it later on, but I recorded a podcast with Bruno Giros. Yes. And Bruno had mentioned that your dad, Mark, would come to him and visit and they would meet in France and he would always talk about how proud he was of your research. And he was mentioning to Bruno, oh, I love the work she's doing. She's so great and she's so much better. Like her work is so much more interesting than I would, what I've been doing. Oh and I God. thought, there you go, dad. That's that's, yeah. that's a proud dad moment there. That, that's a very proud dad. And, and um, <laughs> a, a vastly overstated and exaggerated <laughs> evaluation, I have to say. <laughs> But, you yeah. know, I think I think he was entitled to to saying that. And, yeah. and Bruno was was mentioning and I was like, yeah, I remember. And while we were recording the first three episodes, 100 to 102, uh, there was this fax, uh, you know, that was in your dad's wallet that was mentioned. Yes. And it was results from the work performed in Bruno's team. And I cannot remember right now what it was about, but your dad went to Paris and showed Bruno the facts, I think, in his, still in his wallet, like 10 yeah. years later. And he said, this is yeah. the best result I've ever received. So yeah. I think there was that enthusiasm that that came out mm -hmm. uh, towards yeah. his work, but also towards what, what you're what you're doing. Yeah. And and I think dad had that, you know, um, that was one of the things in the in the episodes. Many people talked about how, you know, the lab environment was always positive, even through the negatives. Right. And, and that's something that's so hard to achieve as a PI or as a lab leader or, or even just as a colleague and a member of a team, you know, because most of science is really hard and most of science is failure, right? I mean, let's just be real, you know, nine out of 10 experiments fail, nine out of 10 grants are not funded, you know, it, so it's, uh, it, you have to have a lot of grit and a lot of uh, patience and but through that you've got to find a way to to stay positive and you know that and that can come in many forms and it comes with humor and it comes with good relationships and it comes with being able to detach sometimes you know like get a step away and and uh not to, you know let let the the bad experiment ruin your week right yeah. And, and I think dad really, I, I think people really appreciated that humanism that he brought to the lab every day. And just, um, you know, that, yeah, we're, we're all in this together. We're all going to work hard. We're going to have hard times, but we're going to laugh through it. And we're, we're going to, you know, it, because if you don't have that positive energy and that, that, you know, that the humor to, to recognize, well, it's going to work next time, you know, <laughs> that <laughs> yes. it, it, could, it can certainly get really depressing. Right. Of course. So I think dad, um, certainly for me, you know, he, he instilled in me that grit and that, you know, don't give it up. And, you know, yeah, it was hard and it's, it's going to fail again, but keep doing it. Right. And, uh, yeah. and let's do it with a smile and let's have fun with it. Right. Um, yeah. So, yeah. That's, that's, you just gave me a great podcast idea to talk about the negatives and see who, uses what kind of mechanism to kind of get, go over that hump of of negative data or stuff that doesn't work and I think that's that's an art in itself it really is yeah and and you know as as a department chair I advise junior faculty now um and you know that, that that's it's one of my favorite parts of my job I have to say I mean I love science but I also love mentoring um you know young scientists and junior faculty and and you know we meet quarterly and just and we are talking about those difficult things, like when things aren't working, right? When things are, when things do work, it's, it's wonderful. And everybody's, you know, it, it's great and you celebrate, but it's, it's those moments of difficulty and the struggles that, that you just have to have a lot of mentorship and a network of people to help support you and give you ideas and, and approach that, you know, as positively as possible, um, because that's science. You know, it, if, if science were easy and, and we would always succeed, there wouldn't be science anymore, right? Because we would have figured it all out, right? So it's- um, it, You'd it's, be measuring cyclic AMP in your kitchen. <laughs> that's right, that's right. It, it would be easy and we wouldn't have jobs. So, <laughs> exactly. so the fact that it's hard is something that, that, you know, is not for everyone, but it's something that, that needs to be embraced. And to, to have a career as long as my father's, you know, and, and still be 
you know, even, you know, before he passed away, he was still, you know, so actively engaged in grants and papers and, you know, the, the lab was really running at a very high level. Um, to keep that motivation and joy takes, you know, some really special talents and, and special insights about, you know, what's important in life and what's important in life are people's relationships, friendships, family, um, you know, and humor and, and happiness and, and hobbies and, you know, all of these things. So Agreed. Agreed. Let's take a step back. You mentioned that while you were going through your training, you try, I don't know, I, don't, I can't remember the terms that you use, but you, you, you went into the science in science and worked on other topics before coming full circle back to GPCRs. And it sounded to me that it was kind of a, an intentional path because yes. you wanted to differentiate yourself. Yes. I mean, absolutely. Right. So when I trained in, in graduate school, these were still the days where there were not many women faculty, or at least there certainly were not many tenured women faculty. Um, and so, and, and there were not that many women in graduate school yet, you know, so, um, and it was important to me that, you know, if I, if I was going to be successful down this path, that I wasn't there because I'm Mark's daughter, you know, I'm, and I'm, I'm okay with it, you know, oh, it's Mark's daughter. I, I'm okay. I've been that way for 52 years. I'm Mark's <laughs> daughter. Um, but, but for my career, you know, it's, it was important that um, my successes were not just due to, oh, that's Mark's daughter. Yeah. but that they were, you know, my own and, and of my own doing. Um, that was even more important because I trained at Duke. <laughs> and so, you know, even more important to, to really distinguish myself and, and go down a different path. And so um, when I was in graduate school choosing rotations, um, I was very deliberate to kind of steer away from, you know, GPCR labs because it, that, you know, my father had such an influence. It, it was, you know, um, hard to, to find that niche that would be different, yeah. but that yet is something that I would still love and be passionate about. And um, so I met Keith Parker, who was my PhD advisor, and he was an MD PhD and uh, chief of the endocrine division and had worked on nuclear receptors, right? So, you know, growing up thinking of receptors, 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 um, you know, it, this was something new to me that there are nuclear receptors and they work on DNA, right? So no GPCR person thinking about the nucleus and, you know, DNA, yeah. so this is perfect, right? So it's a different cellular compartment and there's these nuclear receptors, they bind to DNA, fantastic. There's not a GPCR in sight. And um, so, <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right. So, and, and it was also developmental biology, which I was very interested in. And then lastly, Keith was just an amazing mentor. Um, he was a father of five children um, and was just, you know, had, had a great uh, family unit, you know, of course, a wife who was so supportive, but also he, he was a dad and bringing his kids into the lab on the weekends. And so maybe in some ways that reminded me of, of my life. Right? Um, so, you know, I have really fond memories of, of having Keith's children in the lab on the weekends because um, I grew up that way. Um, but so he instilled in me this really Im the importance of work life balance and um, that, you know, family is important. Work is important. Um, and, and so he was just a fantastic mentor. And so and in those days, we focused on uh, nuclear receptors and a new um, uh, protein that was identified in cholesterol transport within the mitochondria um, and the process of steroid biosynthesis. Um, and this was right around the time that knockout mice were really coming uh, into, into being, right? So, so it was a big deal to make a knockout mouse when, when I was training as a graduate student. So that was my thesis, was to focus on these stereogenic pathways using knockout mice. Um, yeah. yeah. I think, I feel like there was this, this boom of, of, you know, we realized we can do knockouts and then every conference you would go to, you would present not mouse data and they'd be like, where's the mouse? <laughs> where's yeah. the knockout mouse? And you're like, no, yeah. no. It's, it's different. We don't do that yet, or we're not yeah. going to do it, or we can collaborate. Yeah. Um, and then what, after you completed your PhD, where what happened next? Did you go, how did you pick, first of all, how did you pick your postdoc? Yeah, so my postdoc, I interviewed it at several places um, in the triangle. That's because my husband um, 
was is uh, MD PhD, and he was still doing his training at Duke University. And so we were we were we we're a dual career science couple, but we were never in that position where we could in the early days, you know, pick up and move together, right? Because either I was in this phase of my training or he's in that phase of his training. So um, I, I did look locally um, and again, very fortunate that the Research Triangle Park in North Carolina is just this wonderful, you know, ecosystem of, you know, institutions at NIEHS, NC State, UNC and Duke. And so I, I interviewed at all of these different institutions um, and really just fell in love with the research program of Oliver Smithies. So Oliver Smithies was here at UNC um, and he is one of UNC's Nobel Prize winners um, for his contributions for gene targeting in mouse models. And so, you know, I, I had knew of Oliver because when I was a graduate student um, making a knockout mouse, there were not core facilities that made these things. You know, it, it didn't like it, it wasn't automated like it is now, and you, you couldn't go online and buy these things. You had to collaborate with people who were making mice. And Oliver, um, being you know one of the first person with Tom Capecchi, uh, uh, Mario Capecchi to characterize homologous recombination, you know he he was the guy. I mean, he was the guy who made knockout mice, and so it was just uh, this this ability to to take you know, this approach, a, a holistic approach of querying the function of a gene or a protein in a whole animal and modeling human disease was, was just like absolutely the most amazing you know, thing that I could think to do my career on. And so it was you know, wonderful when Oliver offered me a postdoc position. Um, it was the lowest salary of all the other offers I had, but, but I took it because he, he had not won the Nobel Prize at the time, um, but, but I knew that he would be a great mentor. Um, and, and I just loved this approach, right, of gene targeting. And so I learned myself how to do gene targeting, and that was my postdoc. And I, I in the end, generated, I think, over 40 different gene targeted um, mouse lines because we were a gene targeting factory, right? We made mice. Yeah. Um, now, of course, we, we ship it off. Even in my lab, we ship this stuff off <laughs> to be done by companies. But um, that's where I learned really cardiovascular physiology. And that, that theme has continued into my research program. So we studied genes that regulate um, blood pressure and vascular tone. Um, and we also studied genes that regulate uh, heart development and heart injury. So, so I learned cardiovascular physiology with Oliver um, and, and the, using this applied mouse models approach. So. I love it. I love it. And then, and then you, once you completed your postdoc, or did you already know that you wanted to be a professor? You kind of had a biased vision there at home growing yeah. up, but was that something that came to you now? Was it a natural progression or do you think you were influenced? Yeah. To stay in academia was yeah. it a natural progression? Yeah. Um, no, it, it wasn't. Um, like, like many people <laughs> will tell you, you know, there's bumps in the roads and, and you consider different careers. Um, many of the postdocs from the Smithies lab, um, in, in that era, and, and I was one of the more senior postdocs um, before before he, you know, stopped recruiting people. To, so Oliver passed away um, late in, in late 80s. And so um, so the lab was kind of, you know, getting smaller and smaller. Um, and many of the postdocs who trained there went into positions in academia where they were running core facilities, right? I mean, if, if you're University of Wisconsin and you need to establish a new mouse core facility, you hire postdocs who trained in, in the lab that, that you yeah. know, uh, exactly. is credited for doing the technology. So, so a lot of the postdocs went into those types of roles, um, core directors, and many of them also went into industry. Um, doing the same thing. And, and I had um, several offers from industry. Um, at that time, there were lots of companies that were popping up um, with the objective of, you know, knocking out every gene in the mouse genome and, and, um, and or doing uh, mutagenesis of the genome in mice. And so, so I was very skilled to maybe leap into industry um, with, with the toolkit that I had. Um, but, you know, 
academia was always very appealing to me. I really like the teaching mission and I love the, I love grant writing. Isn't that crazy? I love writing grants. I just love it. Um, we, <laughs> should, we should put together a grant writing workshop. Yes. <laughs> I'd no, love I that. Really yeah, I love writing grants. It's just my funnest thing to do. I mean, I, it's, I, finding the time is a different thing, but you know, it's, yeah. I just, I, I really enjoy that creative process and, um, you know, getting that logic. I'm actually a philosophy major from undergraduate. So that sort of logical thinking and, you know, uh, laying out, you know, a, an experimental plan is something I really enjoy that I, I may not have had as much in industry, you know, as, as an academia. And so it was just very fortuitous that um, a new chair of the physiology department had just been hired at UNC. And his vision was to bring in more people who were studying the mouse with a physiological perspective, right? And, and look, using the mouse as a model for human disease. Um, and so I, it's very serendipitous and very fortunate um, that I was a great fit for, for him and his new vision. Um, and so I actually stayed at UNC. Again, another uh, unusual thing, but total serendipity, right? I mean, like, it, it's very unusual that that happens, um, but- It is, yeah. but at the same time, I think it was convenient for yeah. your situation that applied to you. And yeah. I know we typically leave the inspiring sci young scientist segment to the end, but I think Ooh. people need to think about what works for them. Yes. And this worked for you. It did. It did. And I had, um, I, I had, I did interview at other institutions, but you know, UNC, I, I mean, it's a shameless pitch for UNC, but it's a wonderful place. I mean, I, I, I just cannot imagine, you know, uh, it, what a, what an amazing uh, institution to launch your career and um, to, to do science, so many core facilities and just a great network of cardiovascular researchers. So it was a great fit with a wonderful new chair, Jim Anderson, um, who I knew was going to ensure that I was successful, right? So I, I, I put a lot of, you know, trust in him and, and he sure, you know, paid off and he was a wonderful mentor to me and, and helped ensure that I could launch my lab and, and be successful. So yeah. I, I, re I really like it. But I'll, I'll, once we stop recording, we need to talk about this grant writing workshop. I've been thinking okay. about putting it together for such a long time now and I was trying to figure out okay who can I ask but since you love writing grants mm -hmm. we will find the time to record maybe smaller increments we can make a plan okay but I think a lot of people would be very interested in that because for I hate writing that's the worst thing that can happen to me I am a lab oh, person yeah if you tell me Yamina this is the question or Yamina come up with the question I'm thinking about the experiments and I have tears in my eyes whenever I plot uh, dose response curves and they're beautiful oh, uh, ask me to ask me to write it uh, write a grant is just it I think the process can be very enjoyable as you mentioned when when you have the time to build up your your abilities to do it you have to do it enough times but unfortunately we get pulled into so many directions and as you pointed out sometimes it's difficult to find the time to do it Yes, yes. I think for faculty, I know that faculty, myself included, and faculty in our department do complain a lot, you know, finding that time and blocking off that time. That's time management, a uh, whole different... Um, <laughs> Which it, we can have know, a workshop around, too. <laughs> workshop on that, too, exactly. But, um, but early on, you're right. You know, it's, it's grant writing, it's very formulaic. And it's, um, there, there is a formula to it. You know, there's a strategy to it. And the it's it's all about you know providing really innovative exciting ideas but yet in a very structured uh document that the reviewers are going to enjoy reading right i mean it, it has to be an enjoyable read because the worst thing you can do is write a grant that they're reading at 11 30 at night and upset because they can't find the figure or this is you know doesn't make sense or it's not well connected so there's a lot of um you know, they, it's called grantsmanship, right? Of just yeah. thinking about ways to structure exciting science within the confines of a, you know, formulaic, yeah. you know, grant proposal. Um, and so, and those two things seem a little different, right? Like being different and innovative and cool and, and cutting edge, but yet very structured. Um, yeah. 
And so, yeah, there, there's, there's strategies to do it actually. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I can feel your excitement around this topic. So we need to, yeah. we need to talk okay. about it. Let's, let's go back to science. You've started your lab. Um, you're, you're working with, with mouse models. Where do GPCRs come back into the picture at this point? Yeah. Yeah. And this is so funny, you know, it's serendipity, right? Um, so, so during my, um, postdoc, again, I mentioned that I was working on factors that regulate blood pressure. And, uh, one, my project basically is Oliver gave me his R1 and he said, here, you do this project, right? So it was a five-year R1 and the, the, uh, just spare me this little story, but you'll see very quickly where it goes. So, so the, the objective was to, uh, generate an animal model where we can genetically control at the investigators choosing the level of renin hormone. Renin is one of the major homeostatic hormones that regulates the renin angiotensin system. And the reason that it was important to, to clamp renin was because any time that the Smithies lab or other labs all over the world would try to study hypertension in a mouse model, renin would re, re, renin would kick in and reset homeostasis. So even though you know that, you know, knocking out ACE or angiotensin receptor should result in hypertension, the animal is smarter than we are. And the renin gene comes in and resets homeostasis. So the objective was to generate animal lines where that homeostasis is under our control and we can clamp it and then introduce these different genetic mutations and ask what each gene's contribution is to the regulation of blood pressure. So the genetically clamped renin transgene, which is a single site insertion gene targeting approach is, is what my project was. It was a tool, right? So th this, th there, there was no hypothesis there, right? So it, you know, control renin levels, what do you do? You change the levels of blood pressure, right? Th th there, there was, it, it was not an inquiry into what does this protein do or how is this thing regulated? It was building a tool. And one day I was in the lab, I was about, I don't know, three years in, it was going very well. You know, I had all these ESLs and, you know, it was, it was great. Um, and Oliver came into the lab, which was unusual because usually he would be at his bench. Um, he always worked at the bench. And so you would go visit Oliver. But one day Oliver came and visited me. And he said, Caron, and he always called me Caron, Caron, <laughs> you look bored. And I said, I, I was scared to death. I was almost vomiting. It was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to tell Oliver. <laughs> yes, I'm bored because your R01 is boring. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, right? Like how, how um, you know, how obnoxious, right? To tell a, a future Nobel laureate that his R01 <laughs> is boring, right? <laughs> But it was in a way, right? There, there yeah. it was. Um, tool development is important, and and it's important to to create these innovative tools that enable you know science um, and and good rigorous science. But um, it, it takes away that that excitement and energy and hypothesis you know inquiry, right? To discover something new. So I told him, I said, I am bored, Oliver. Um, and he said, Well, tell you what, tell you what. Very well, very well. British, you know, very well, very well. Uh, you know, you're doing really well. So, you know, why don't you come up with something and you you can make a mouse, you know, a, of your choosing. So you you pick a gene and you make a knockout mouse, you know, and you decide. My only caveat is that it, if you knock out a gene, you should at least try to make it so that the mouse is hypertensive, right? Because we're studying hypertension. So in a very unromantic and uninspired way, I went to PubMed and I typed in vasodilator because if you want a mouse to have high blood pressure, maybe you can knock out a vasodilator and then it'll make it hyperconstricted. And, and there were only three papers published on the adrenomedulin gene that had just been cloned um, yeah. by, um, um, in, in a, by a group in Japan. And so I, with only three papers, I said, okay, this is a good one. So I cloned the gene and, you know, and made an adrenomedulin knockout mouse. Okay, fine. So, and that was very exciting and we had a great phenotype. And then while we were publishing this paper, there was a putative receptor for the adrenomedulin gene peptide. It's a, it's a peptide hormone. And lo and behold, it's a G-protein coupled receptor. Of course it is. 
Of course it is, because GPCR is control everything. And I remember calling down. It's like, oh, no, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> like, guess what? The adrenomedulin receptor is probably a GPCR. <laughs> and, and, you know, and you laugh, of course, right? Because everything's a GPCR, right? Yeah. So, so my lab then worked, um, at, or with Oliver actually, very much with Oliver's help. Um, he helped me clone CLR. It's a, it's a nasty gene with tons of exons and very GC rich. Um, unlike most GPCRs, it, it's a very complex gene structure. Um, and so Oliver helped me make the, the targeting vector for CLR. And so we made the knockout for, for that GPCR. And then the, the ramps were discovered, right? And, and this is where serendipity, you know, what can you do, right? I mean, it, it was this fascinating, you know, science paper, oh my gosh, you know, there's these new proteins and they regulate different facets of GPCRs yeah. and you just have to go there, right? I mean, so, so the ramps were identified because they modulate CLR activity. And so that's where serendipity comes in, right? There, there was no way I could ignore the ramps. <laughs> um, so my career then, as Oliver promised, right? You know, do something, uh, create something and, and take it with you. And you can launch your lab with that. It was a great partnership. And I'm so grateful to him to have given me that freedom and given me that, that ability to, I mean, I started my lab with a whole cohort of ramp mice and you know, CLR mice, and, and that's a credit to Oliver and his generosity. Um, and, and many PIs won't do that, right? Um, but he did, and, and he gave me that chance. He entrusted me to, to develop my own thing. And uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for Oliver. Yeah. I love it. It's a great story. So you were bored and now you start you work on CLR and, and, and the ramps. <laughs> and the ramps, yeah. And, and I remember Oliver, um, you know, I, I was very hesitant about going into ramps. First, because I'm Mark's daughter, right? <laughs> so, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, that, 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 that never goes away, right? I will always be Mark's daughter. So I was always very hesitant, like, oh, this is a big risk, you know, to go GPCRs, right? Um, and, and so that worried me. But the other thing that worried me is that the ramps were discovered um, through um, GlaxoSmithKline and, and Stephen Ford's group. Um, yes. And, and so I was just a little worried about competing or, you know, uh, having, you know, a pharmaceutical company come in and, and scoop me basically, right? Because if you're going to commit to making knockout mice, you need to commit a year, you know, a, of time before you're even thinking of publishing the paper. And, and there Oliver also was just really inspirational to me. And he said, well, just give them a call. And I, I was should... just going to say that. Why don't you collaborate? <laughs> And I said, what? You know, and he said, well, you know, just, just call this guy. You know, wait, what's his name? Stephen Ford? You know, let, let, just call him. Ask him what he thinks. And, and I, you know, I had to sit on that for a little while because as a young postdoc, you know, you just, you don't just pick up the phone and call somebody. Yeah. And so, you know, but I did. And, and I'll never forget that day, right? I, I went to a little conference room off in the side where I could have some privacy and I, picked up the phone and I called Stephen Ford and I said, hi, I'm just this little postdoc in North Carolina. And I'm wondering if, you know, what you would think if I made ramp mice. And he said, absolutely go for it. You know, do it. Absolutely. Let me send you my plasmids. And, and he did, you know, he, he was so generous and uh, was really kind and generous and supportive and said, go for it. You know, we'd love for you to do that. And so, um, yeah, so, you know, just branching out of your comfort zone and recognizing that the scientific community more often than not is collegial, not collaborative, not competitive, right? Um, so that I, love was that, I love that story. Stephen was on one of our podcast episodes. Yes. And um, I remember, you know, him telling the Ram story. And now I, I, I have another facet of it. Yes. Yeah. And um, he's he's such a wonderful guy. He's such an amazing guy. Love it. Absolutely. I don't know you had a chance to listen to that episode but they they had <laughs> so for two this was during covid so for two years he was mentioning that no one came into the house during the day he's retired yeah. now yes and yeah. on the day of within the hour where we were recording the podcast some roof workers came were knocking uh-huh and he said, wait a minute, I have to go. So he gets up, gets lets the roofing people, roofers come in and do whatever yeah. they need to do. And then we're recording. And then Fiona walks, walks in coming home from something and you can hear her heels and yes, hi. Yes. And, she yeah. in, and he's like, two years, no one came in at this time. And now that we're recording this, 
this is happening. Yeah. So you got a two for one. You got Fiona and Steven. (laughs) Yes, I did. I had, well, actually, I had Fiona previously and Uh she said, you have to talk to Steve and I've had him and and they're both such wonderful people. I really, really really um, are. Yeah. They're so, so, so amazing people. And I feel like it's important to talk about, you you mentioned getting out of the comfort zone. It's important to get out of your comfort zone. It is. It and then you made an effort to get out of your GPCR comfort zone. Yeah. And yeah. then the, you know, like the, uh, the, the, the movie, the quote of the uh, Godfather, you know, just when I thought I was out, they pulled me right back in. <laughs> they pulled me right back in. Yes, exactly. There's no way to get around it. Yeah. <laughs> But but you know it's been wonderful, right? And and I think that uh, I I I never regret that I, I veered you know into a different path. I thought that was really healthy and very good. Um, but you know I I love the GPCR field, you know, and and well for I just love the science, right? I mean who doesn't? How, how can you not, right? Um, and um, but what a wonderful field and just you know great people, extremely collaborative and lots of great ideas and so many things to do right so um it's i'm it's an honor for me actually to to be you know a small member um uh, uh, making small contributions um to this really big field yeah i think i think it's a great field and and you mentioned you know people are being most of the time people are very helpful and uh this is a message out to all the trainees it's okay to pick up the phone and it's okay to send that email because most of the time you're gonna get a a help, helping hand helping you out. Yes, yes. More, more often than not. Yes. Than not. I think so too. I think yeah. so too. So now I have to ask because I ask everyone, what is okay. your favorite GPCR? And it can be anything within the yes. GPCR family signaling. Right. Project. My favorite GPCR is the GPCR that people never thought worked with ramps. And what do you know? It does. And it turns out that that's a lot of GPCRs. (laughs) Any any ramp interacting GPCR, particularly the unexpected ones, um, are just fascinating, right? Because to me, I you know, as we're learning more about the 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 proteomic networks and the local interactors and regulators of the receptors, not just at the membrane, but in the endosomes and as they're trafficking. Um, you know, the, these ramp molecules, these, you know, mother nature's allosteric modulators are there yeah. and they are doing things that we never considered. And it really makes you think, well, gosh, we have a lot of experiments that we should repeat because maybe we should throw in a ramp. You know, if this is a ramp interacting receptor and we did, we use cells that don't express ramps we'll get a completely different, you know, pharmacology from the receptor or different signaling pathway, depending on the ramp that you throw in. So to me, any GPCR that interacts with ramps is very exciting. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. You know, that that makes me think about, you know, expression, like endogenous expression of the ramps. And you mentioned experiments. I know hex cells have some, if not all the ramps. It depends on the hex cell sub culture yes or some, the some, vial. There, are, there are some hex that have no ramps um yeah and then some that express more more one or the other yeah and then you never know which one it is and i think it's 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 this variability and this horrible thing about hex cells which yeah. by the way i love hex cells i loved working with hex cells because they're easy to work with and you know over ch2 cells for example but then i had to look for the vial of hex cells that from which I could grow a culture that didn't have this or that uh, yes. express, yes. which I think yes. it's very important to keep in mind when you're starting a new project yeah. to verify that your gene of interest is not expressed in there. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Physiologically, are ramps ubiquitously expressed in, in tissues and cells or? They, they generally are, um, but not all cells have all ramps. And uh, ramps are expressed at different levels in different cells, right? Mm-hmm. So you can have a cell that has only ramp one and ramp three, but not ramp two or some combination, right? There are only three mammalian ramps. Yeah. Um, and so then it's just a, a, a combination of relative levels of expression. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the more perplexing questions in our field right now, as we think about ramps and 
well, there's two perplexing questions. The, the first is, you know, what is the repertoire of receptors that they do interact with? And, and when we define interaction, are we defining a biochemical interaction by Brett that we see in a hex cell because we, we forced it upon the cell? Or are we talking about a native interaction, you know, in a native level expressing receptor in a native cell? So, so which receptors interact with which ramps? That's a huge question. And, and our lab is, and other labs, of course, are tackling this. Um, but then I think another, you know, so, so maybe once you have that repertoire of GPCRs, and, it, and it's more than just the secretin family, there's many, um, yeah. almost every chemokine receptor interacts with ramps. Um, once you have that information, then it's the more difficult question, which which I, you know, this keeps me up at night. I, and I'm not quite sure I know how to figure it out. But like in, in a given cell, let's say there are all three ramps. How how and why does a receptor decide, it's not decide, it, I, proteins don't make decisions, yes. but but how- how them personalities, so. Yes, but how, how would it choose which ramp it's going to associate with and or how does the receptor uh you know is there preference or is there specificity for a receptor to preferentially bind to ramp two as an example for clr in an endothelial cell but bind to ramp one in a neuron and and because neurons express ramp two as well. So how does the CLR receptor know which ramp it should be binding with in the different cell types? And this is something that I don't think we have a good handle on. I know we don't have a good handle on. And, um, you know, we're approaching it in different ways. Of course, we're approaching it with mouse models, tissue specific deletion of the ramps, right? And, and but again, that's very difficult to tease apart because now you're asking a physiology question yeah. on, a, on a cellular pathway question. Um, and then we're using, you know, proximity labeling approaches and, you know, trying to identify the interactome of the ramps. Um, so anytime there's a new technology that's, you know, enables us to ask that, you know, huge question, um, our lab tries to jump on it as fast as we can. So, but, but I think that these are, without this information, we're, we're going to, you know, trudge along a little bit, right? So, so I think we, we need to identify those key factors. First, we need to define the potential interacting receptors mm -hmm. and then go in and ask that very difficult question of which ramp and why and how. How, how is it one ramp over another ramp? I, I, I think that's, a, that's an important question and I, I'll take it to the next level. Would a disease state change the interaction between a receptor and a given ramp or would it abolish that or how does that even how does that even happen but i think yes. the, answer to the first yeah. question is, is is vital yes yeah absolutely and and we do think it we think it does um we know that there are physiological conditions uh that we've characterized uh mostly related to estrogen and its regulation of ramp three um mm -hmm. that do do change uh, the, the, the receptor that they're interacting with and the functions of those receptors. So we know that physiology, estrogen for one example, or cardiovascular disease like cardiac hypertrophy can change uh, the, the ramp interacting GPCRs and what those ramps are doing to those GPCRs. So, you know, it's- How uh, cool is this? It's very I mean, cool. It, yeah. I think it's really cool. It's just- yeah. It's just such yeah. an, yeah, well, we could talk about how cool the field is and how, how cool it is for, for hours, for sure. Um, if you had a magic wand and you could, you know, make appear a new method that would allow you to answer the central question that you're working on, what would that method look like? Mm. It's a tough one. It is a tough one. Yeah. It might be a little along the lines of cryo EM, but even cooler, right? It, I would love to be the magic wand, really crazy science fiction, yes. right? Uh, I would love to be able to see the receptor in the membrane of a cell, a real cell, not a hex cell, but a cell. Um, so see it in a, in a native tissue, um, you know, maybe labeled or, you know, peppered and decorated with flags or things. Um, 
it, it, in, in a living state with its interactome, right? Mm -hmm. So if we could visualize and see those interacting proteins, uh, and, and again, I'm thinking of ramps and, and you know, yeah. other related proteins, um, maybe maybe more beyond the signaling, right? I mean, we're, we're getting there with beta arrestin and G proteins, right? But, yeah. but, but more so that these scaffolding proteins and these other accessory proteins that kind of um, control where the receptor is and, and where it goes and, and whether it's engaged for signaling. And, and if we could, if we had a magic wand to just see that, um, that would be amazing. Don't I quite know how to do it, but yeah, I, I don't know either. But I think it sounds yeah. like a fun movie to be watching in like yeah. you know, IMAX yeah. 3D laser, you name yes. it, and you're sitting there yeah. and you can see the whole thing happening. Yes, that would be very cool. Yeah. And and a way to sort of like at the same time that you're seeing it, you're seeing new proteins coming in, you know, like it's somehow decorating the pro the proteomic network in that receptor. Mm -hmm at that time, you know, and, and ramp would, you know, how, how did the, how does the ramp being there change what, how that receptor is presented, um, you know, would just be amazing. So, and of course the cryo-EM structures, you know, Patrick Sexton has made these beautiful uh, publications with the cryo-EM structure. So we're there at a molecular level, but I would like to take it just a little out a little bit and look at the cell um, in, a, in a living tissue or a living organism. That would just be fascinating. Yeah. 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 Well, I, you know, structures are great, but it's just a snapshot. I think a yeah. collection of, of, of structures that allow you to follow these changes and confirmation and have put this together would be really amazing. Then again, we, we still talk, we're still talking about a magic wand scenario here. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Maybe, maybe in the future we'll be able to stabilize and, and take snapshots of a receptor interacting with various proteins I'm certain. I, I'm absolutely certain. Yeah. So, you know, it's magic wand, but it's not that far off. You know, I, yeah. like yeah, I, yeah. I, I think we will see this, you know, it, it's, yeah. um, it, we will, we will get there. I, uh, I'm, I'm actually pretty confident of that. <laughs> and then so once we do, you know, that will open the doors to new therapies and, you know, toolkits for yeah. ramp interacting GPCRs. So that, you know, and arenumab is, is the best example of this, right? Where, where the, the antibody itself, the first antibody to target a GPCR by virtue of the fact that it is a, you know, recognizes the epitope of CLR and RAMP1, right? So very, very specific to that receptor when it's with RAMP1, not when it's with RAMP2 or RAMP3. So, you know, when, when we can soon, when we can have all that information, it will enable, you know, drug companies to start developing highly specific antibody-based tools to target these receptors. Yeah, I think it's cool. Do you have a favorite between RAMP one, two, and three? Uh, <laughs> you mentioned RAMP two multiple times. That's why I'm wondering. Yeah, uh, I I really like RAMP two because unlike RAMP one and RAMP three, it's essential for survival. So if you if you knock out ramp one or ramp three, the mice live to an old age and they're fine. They're not fine. They have phenotypes, but you know they live. Um, ramp two is you know critic, and as I mentioned, I've been trained as a developmental biologist, right? So I love development. So anytime you have a protein that is so critical that it's essential for life, you know that to me that's like you know that just you know makes the hair on my back, back <laughs> of my neck like oh my god, it's so important, right? You can't live without it. Um, so, so I really love the essential um, requirement of ramp two for survival, and 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 how that you know then in an adult animal plays out in multiple different organs with multiple different receptors. So it it seems to carry a lot of importance um, to to the function um, of, of the mammalian system. But ramp three is is very perplexing too. I love ramp three because it seems to be doing things that we really don't fully um, give it credit for in terms of receptor recycling, um, constitutive activity of receptors that have perplexed the field for decades. Um, I, I, you know, our, our data and, and some maybe yet unpublished, but and some published 
are really starting to shine a light on the importance of this ramp in these sort of unexpected roles. So I, I think ramp three is, is going to be fun. Um, I think so too. And well, I'll, I'll talk to you. I, I have a couple of ideas. I'll talk to you after where we stop. Okay. Recording. Awesome. Gonna, people are going to be wondering like, what are they talking about <laughs> once they stop recording? Yeah. I ask this always. And so far the answer has been yes, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Do you think GPCRs are still good drug targets? And why? Yes. yes, I think they are. And maybe, you know, alluding to, to what I just said, I, I you know, uh, cheers to the small molecules and the drug screens, right? I mean, that's so key and so fast. And, um, but, you know, again, as we start to learn about how the receptor is complexed with other things at the membrane, right? Or in the endosome, right? We, if we can exploit its neighbors um, to develop better or more specific drug targets that would be specific to a cell and not every cell, right? Um, I, I do think that that's a, a new frontier. To, you know, the cartoons always depict the GPCR in a plasma membrane and there's nothing else around it. And that's just not the, the biology of it, right? So if we can learn to exploit its neighbors um, to develop these you know, tools, um, pharmacological tools, right? That, that take into consideration the receptor as it lives in a native cell with all of its neighbors. To me, that kind of blows open so many um, possibilities for, for drug targets, right? That it, it might not just be the receptor, but it might be it, as it's complex with other neighboring um, factors, right? I think it makes a lot of sense. And I know we, we typically focus on the GPCR itself. And I wonder if we could think about focusing, you know, comparing disease versus healthy state yeah. and focusing not only on the GPCR that we know is implicated in that disease, but also on the neighbor, on the changes in the neighboring proteins yes. intracellularly as well. And I, I like the idea of targeting the receptor on cells that have something changed. Yeah. So I think having this potentially for thinking about antibodies, having antibodies that recognize, I don't know, ramp and the yeah. receptor. And we know that ramp two associated with the risk receptor only happens in cases of cancer or yes. you know, yeah. any sorts of diseases. I think this is a really, really yeah. cool. But then again, we have to learn more about what are the name, who are the neighbors, and what do they do in that specific disease state. Yep. Which I think opens up another can of worms, or we go down a rabbit hole because then sometimes we don't have the tools, or mm -hmm. we don't know what are these neighboring proteins mm -hmm. that influence re receptor function. Yeah, and then and I think we that I think we have to appreciate that that will differ from cell to cell to cell, right? Yes. So an epithelial cell will have a different. The, the receptor might be expressed in ubiquitously, but its partners in an epithelial cell will be very different than in a neuron or in a stromal cell. Or, you know, it, so, so I think the cell type um, is also going to change that as well. Right? There's plenty of space to write more grants yes, <laughs> around all of these questions. <laughs> all right, let's, let's talk a little bit about advice to junior scientists. We've talked about it a little bit during during our conversation so far. Um, anything else you want to share with the audience that you feel like people should take into consideration whenever they're thinking about their careers? And I want to focus a little bit about life, ba life balance, you know, life job balance. Yeah. Yeah. Work-life balance. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's, it's, yeah, there's lots of advice for, for this and, you know, um, but I think ultimately you have to have a good support system. And so you have to be aware and, and you have to foster that those positive networks that will support you outside of science, right? So it's, it might not be enough to just have, you know, a great PI and a good lab. You might also need, you know, a supportive spouse or partner, um, and um, if, if you're at the stage of having children, you know, you need kids who um, 
who love that that you work, <laughs> you know, and you will inspire <laughs> them to to do to love that, of course. Um, it, it, but you know, having a, a supportive family who is supportive of your ambitions and um, and and your passions, and and that's not so hard to do, um, because when when you're happy and supported, um, you know, it shows, and th those people who surround you and love you support you in that happiness and that, you know, so, but, but it's important to nurture that and not take it for granted because when things get hard, um, that's, that's what's there to catch you. Right. So, you know, sci science will get hard. You will have, you will stumble. You will have times in your career where things, you know, stump, it, it happens to everyone. No, no one has this like perfect career. No one. Um, but the constant is the network of family and friends that, that support you to, to get you through that. And, and sometimes that's a lab family, but it's more often than not outside of science. Um, and so I think that that's, you know, in terms of work-life balance, um, that, that's an important element. And it can be a big group of people where it could just be two or three, right? Like it, every person is different, right? Your, your network and, and your support structure it does, it, it's not cookie cutter right it, um yeah. and so um but just having that something to fall back on so that when when the days are long or things are not going great um you have that support structure i love it i think that's very important and i think it transpired getting back to to the podcast episodes we recorded with over 30 people i think that's what came through the yeah. messaging is that it was a it is a big corona family yeah. And there is that support structure and yeah. there is that, that personal connection mm -hmm. that, that was built throughout those years. And I have a feeling that you took that, 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 that lesson from your dad and put it into your work with your lab, with the junior faculty that you advise mm -hmm. into making sure that there is that support system. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a really important thing. And, you know, at, throughout all stages, right, graduate students need a great support structure and mm -hmm. um, junior faculty need it as well. And, you know, and, and even actually, this, this is an interesting thing that I've sort of found myself uh, becoming pretty passionate about and learning about. I'm trying to learn a lot about this, but, but the decision of when to retire, right? So, you know, if you're a faculty member and you go through your career stages, and for faculty and, and young faculty, you know, they, they, they're they just wanting that, you know, achieve the tenure, right? It's the road to tenure and get your tenure, right? Today, just today, actually, it's a huge, we had two faculty in our department get tenure today. I'm so excited. Oh, that's um, great. Guess what? They still need mentoring, right? So like tomorrow, they're a tenured associate professor, but the mentoring doesn't stop. And the, and the mid-career faculty, you know, have every... It, you know, science throws you all kinds of things, right? And it's those who are, who have grit and who are adaptable and who can change and evolve. Those are the people who, you know, stay in science and continue to love it, right? And um, so mid-career faculty often, uh, you know, have challenges of, well, there's always work-life balance, you know, uh, the, the little kids, it's little problems. The big kids can sometimes be big problems, right? So, so uh, you know, it's, and projectile vomiting at daycare is rather different than, um, you know, uh, teenagers who have a variety of different issues, let's say, or young adults. Um, so, so, you know, the spectrum of, uh, of, work, of family balance changes with, as, as our careers evolve. And then also scientifically, um, you know, our, our career, you know, as, as you progress in your career, technology advances much faster than you do. And so it's a challenge for mid-career faculty to stay abreast and stay on top of the new technologies. And, and sometimes it's difficult to recognize, you know what, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm ever gonna be able to do this. You know, I, I don't know that I can code in R. Like th this, this is past me, right? Like, um, or, you know, I, I don't know that I can do this, this new fancy technology, but how do I, you know, still embrace it and bring it into my laboratory? How do I stay cutting edge, you know? So I think mid-career mid or established faculty have those 
difficulties and they need mentoring and they need, and it comes in different forms, peer mentoring or networks and things. And then there's the senior faculty who face a totally different question of when, when do I retire? And when do I, when, when is a good time and how do I do that? It, because, you know, when you're a scientist in academia, it is your identity. It is, it is who you are. It is what you do 24 seven all the time, even on the weekends, you know, it's like, it's all the time. And then you come to a point where you're tired or maybe you want to do something different and how do you step away? So I've come to sort of be an advocate that mentoring, you know, and, and support structures are needed throughout the scientific career. Um, there, it's different, it's different flavors, it's different issues, but um, we should, you know, it's mentoring is key to at every stage of the career. Um, so our, our department is trying to do that, you know, provide different types of mentoring structures and resources for our faculty through the career stages. Um, just to, to provide a, a supportive community um, for our faculty. I think you made, you made an important point here about mentoring. And I think it's all about, and I think even a two-year-old needs mentoring. <laughs> I think yes. we need mentoring <laughs> all throughout, through our life. And I think as we grow and we end up in science and we have our labs and things like that, we get to choice as to who do we want to be mentored by or who do we want to mentor but as a two-year-old, you can't really pick mom or dad or, you know, whoever is in your life. And it's, but it's important to also acknowledge your limitations and say, well, I don't know how to code in R. I know that this could be really useful. Why don't I collaborate or why don't I hire someone who actually can yes. do that? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I think as academics, myself included, I grew up in an academic environment where I had to prove that I can learn and do this. Yes. And I think we're past beyond that. You don't have to be doing everything. You just have to figure out what do you need? Is it really what you need? Can you learn it? Or can you find someone who can help you do the work? And then give your head the space, at least in my case, give myself headspace to think about higher level questions instead of focus on the pipetting or on the coding um, yeah, part absolutely. where I know I'm, it's never going to work. I, I would never, I, I can't. I mean, if my life depended on it, maybe. Yeah. But I, yeah. but I think that that's one of the nice parts that, um, you know, most academic institutions now, uh, I, I, I believe most certainly here at UNC, have really embraced and recognized the importance of team science. Yeah. You know, it, it is impossible to do science as an individual. Um, it, even as a lab, um, it's, it's really challenging to be at the cutting edge um, of your discipline and any discipline without relying and receiving, uh, you know, expertise that is interdisciplinary, right? So the best research, in my opinion, right now is happening at those borders where, you know, typically disparate fields are coming together and saying, ah, look at that. You know, who knew that if you apply a mathematical model to, you know, uh, the structure of blood vessels in the skin, you could predict, you know, permeability, who knew, right? So, you know, applying, math and modeling or just take these intersections of different disciplines that have traditionally not worked together, I think is where we're really finding a lot of really new and exciting insights um, into biology and medicine. And And so team science is is really, you know, it's the answer to this, right? You, You can't, you can't be an expert at everything. You just can't. Um, so having those great skills of being a good teammate, um, as, as my daughter is on a volleyball team and we talk about being a great teammate, you know, um, this, this is a, a lesson, life lessons that are important to carry forward, um, you know, and, and being a, a gracious teammate and um, a generous teammate and, you know, always giving your all to what you can contribute um, in appreciation for what others share with you. So, yeah, so I love team it. science is the way. Exactly. I love it. And I think technologies, communication allows us to do that. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's very important. All right. I know we're we're almost at time. 
last last question okay. top three aha moments that you had as a scientist that shaped your trajectory it doesn't have to be aha moments as a scientist just life aha moments yeah top three moments that shaped my trajectory well the discovery of the ramps you know i mean that's hard to avoid uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so that was a big one um yeah let's see i think uh, it's like like camp cooking in the kitchen is is a I, moment i think that's a big moment yeah you know i i think that i i feel so fortunate that uh that i that i grew up with that model that science is so fun right I, how how lucky am i right i mean i just look i mean i am so lucky to have had my father and my family uh expose me at, at a young age and uh you know because because a lot of people don't have that you know i i meet so many people and they say what do you do for a living i'm a scientist and they just look at me i've never met a scientist before you know so i think i am just one of the most fortunate people to have just fallen into you know who I am um, and, and I'm so grateful for it. So that's a, a huge factor um, in my trajectory. And then I think the other one that um, I, I have to say I think has been really something that I really value and enjoy tremendously is um, leadership and mentorship. And, you know, when I charted my career and, you know, and, and don't ever think that um, I don't want to give the impression that I had a plan or a path or that this would turn out perfectly, right? You just kind of stumble along and, and hopefully things work out, right? Um, but somewhere along the way, um, it, it really became evident to me that I really enjoyed mentoring and I enjoyed academic leadership. And, and that's a tough decision, right? To, to say, okay, I'm going to take a certain portion of my time <laughs> and dedicate it to the success of others in the role of a department chair or, you know, um, and, and I really do enjoy that. And so it, it's something that I've so far <laughs> have, have never regretted, right? That, um, but it's, it's a choice, right? To, to say that I have an administrative role, which I view more as a mentorship role, um, but, but learning about leadership, uh, how to be an effective leader, how to be an effective mentor um, is something that I'm, I'm, was a trajectory I had not predicted, right? I, I had, I, if, I, if you had told me when I was a grad student or a postdoc that I would be a department chair one day or you know, a leader and, and I was, oh gosh, no, never, you know, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, so you know, it, it's, um, it's, it's an aha moment that sort of, set a trajectory for me in academic leadership and mentorship that I, I'm very happy that, that it's happened um, because I, I really enjoy that role. Thank you, Kathleen. I was just thinking leader like academic leadership and GPCRs, no, and you ended up pretty yeah. much there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for your time. People can find you uh, at at UNC on, on the UNC's yes. website. Yep. But people will also be able to find you in person at the next Great Lakes GPCR retreat held in November. More information coming out on them, on that. And I am excited to meet you again in person at that meeting. Yes, the, I can't first wait. Time, the first time you and I met was also a GPCR retreat. And we were sitting at the dinner table, we were chatting, and I think it was that time right before the CXCR4 ramp or the chemokine receptor ramp paper was being finalized and I was excited because you told me about it and I was like I cannot wait for this paper to yeah. come out <laughs> me yeah. being a, a chemokine receptor person so yeah. I think it was a wonderful wonderful meeting you and I want to thank you again for being my co-host you're um, welcome well I want to thank you because Yamina it's such a wonderful tribute and um you know, it's, it's just going to have a wonderful legacy. And I just only wish my dad were here to see it. He would be so humbled and so appreciative. And so but on behalf of my whole family, um, I really want to thank you for all your efforts that, that you've done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a great ride meeting all these people that your dad impacted. And we had to reduce the list. We did. I know there were too many. Right? <laughs> I know, but I th I think I think I hope at least that everyone who's going to be listening to this, so the episodes come out by the time our episode comes out, 
100, 102, 1 and 102 would have already been made public. But I'm hoping right. that people will, especially junior faculty and junior scientists, trainees will get a feel and, and learn from the model that, you, that your dad put together. And I want to thank you again for, for all your help, helping yeah. organize this, co-host these episodes. And um, I'll see you in person later this year. Yes, that's right. Thanks, Yamina. Bye-bye. Thanks, Kathleen. Thank you for joining us and listening to this Dr. GPCR podcast episode. We would like to thank Dr. Kathleen Caron, my guest and co-host this month, our Dr. GPCR team members, Attila Forrest, Ines Pinero, and Monsera Avila Zuzoya. And a huge thank you to our ecosystem partners for their support, namely Domain Therapeutics, GPCR Therapeutics, Design Pharmaceuticals, Montana Molecular, and Orion Biotechnology. You can connect with our partners directly in the ecosystem. Join us today at drgpcr.com slash ecosystem. Please subscribe to the Dr. GPCR newsletter. Find us on YouTube. And if you like our podcast, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcast. Another great way to support us is to share your favorite Dr. GPCR program with your network and colleagues. As always, you can email us with any questions or suggestions at hello at drgpcr.com. Until next time, stay safe.